cracking down on China. President Donald Trump takes aim at the communist country for its treatment of the people of Hong Kong. What he also said about former Vice President Joe Biden. Ready for November. Recapping a busy night of primaries, including how former Attorney General Jeff Sessions fared in Alabama. Special delivery. A hospital boat named for Pope Francis is helping the people in Brazil. And cancel culture. A leading Catholic voice weighs in. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, July 15, 2020. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. President Donald Trump wants to eradicate a dangerous international gang, hold China accountable for its treatment of Hong Kong, and rebuild America's roads and bridges. He is talking about those issues all while fighting the coronavirus pandemic and denouncing his Democratic rival. White House correspondent Owen Jensen is covering another busy day. Owen? Tracy, we begin with MS-13. Today here at the White House, President Trump said he wants to eradicate that violent, deadly game. As the nation battles the deadly coronavirus, there is also another target. These people murder children and they do it as slowly and viciously as possible. President Donald Trump describing the vicious gang MS-13. We've just concluded a historic operation leading to the arrest and indictment of dozens of savage MS-13 members and leaders all across the country. The president also announced a crackdown yesterday focused on China. He's concerned about the communist nation's treatment of Hong Kong. Their freedom's been taken away, their rights have been taken away, and with it goes Hong Kong, in my opinion, because it will no longer be able to compete with free markets. One White House countermeasure, a new law. This law gives my administration powerful new tools to hold responsible the individuals and the entities involved in extinguishing Hong Kong's freedom. And no more special status. Today, I also signed an executive order ending U.S. preferential treatment for Hong Kong. Hong Kong will now be treated the same as mainland China. No special privileges, no special economic treatment. As for the virus and President Trump's opponent in November, but if we had listened to Joe Biden, hundreds of thousands of additional lives would have been lost. The Democratic presidential candidate responds. Mr. President, open everything now isn't a strategy for success. It's barely a slogan. And on Wall Street today, optimism, an early rally on hopes of finding a vaccine to stop the virus. Finally tonight, the president was in Georgia announcing a new policy to speed up infrastructure projects across the country by removing red tape. Tracy? White House correspondent Owen Jensen reporting for us tonight. Thank you so much, Owen. Our President Trump was keeping a close eye on primary election results last night, offering congratulations to two GOP primary winners in Texas and in Alabama. And a former Trump ally, recently criticized by the commander-in-chief, suffers a loss at the polls. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. Eric? Well, Tracy, that loss went to former Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Uh, his challenger, retired football coach Tommy Tuberville, carried the ball to victory in Alabama's Republican primary, one of two major victories, which experts say are major wins for President Trump. We issued regulations that protected the little sisters of the poor, and those were put in place by me under my leadership. I talked with former Attorney General Jeff Sessions in May when he was still campaigning for the chance to win back his old Senate seat. Last night with the loss to Tommy Tuberville, a candidate who now has President Trump's support, Sessions is taking the high road and backing his former rival, tweeting, quote, he is our Republican nominee. We must all stand behind him in November. I want to go represent this state, speak for this state, and take that to Washington, D.C. and work with President Donald Trump to make this state in this country better than what it's ever been. In Texas, former White House physician Ronnie Jackson won the GOP nomination for a U.S. House seat last night. The president called to congratulate Jackson, who tweeted, quote, it's official. I am honored to be the Republican nominee for the 13th congressional district in Texas. I am a regular working Texas mom. Also in Texas, Air Force veteran Mary M.J. Hager won the Senate Democrat primary runoff. It sets her up to take on Republican Senator John Cornyn this fall. Democrat Sarah Gideon won her primary last night in Maine. 
She will take on moderate Republican Senator Susan Collins at the polls in November. But as former Senator Jeff Sessions admitted to me, with more than three months to go until Election Day, anything could happen. Well, you know, you never know for sure how this is going to play out. Most definitely. You know, Democrats need at least three seats to gain control of the Republican-led Senate this fall. And the Lone Star State, Texas, seems to be the battleground. A lot of time and money is, are being spent there. And the Democrats tell EWTN that they hope to change it from a red state to a blue. Tracy? Thanks so much, Eric. Correspondent Eric Rosales reporting from Capitol Hill tonight. Our results are in from Hong Kong's unofficial primary election over the weekend, and pro-democracy leaders say voters chose localist candidates. A lot of elderly also wrote for the protest account or localists, which also show uh, the solidarity and the unity is not only about the young generation. Joshua Wong also says the primary election was an opportunity for voters to be heard by the global community. Pro-democracy leaders held the vote to come up with a unified slate of candidates. They hope to get a majority in the 70-seat legislature in Hong Kong's September election. Also in Hong Kong, renewed rules on wearing masks after a spike in COVID-19 cases. Everyone is required to wear face coverings on trains and buses. If they don't, they face a $650 fine. Public gatherings are also restricted again to just four people. In Japan, the governor of Okinawa is asking the U.S. military to be more forthcoming about the number of COVID-19 cases on the American military base. Governor Danny Tamaki tells Japan's defense minister 36 more cases were reported today, bringing the total number to 136. The president of Brazil is reportedly not saying if or when he has taken a new test for COVID-19. Jair Bolsonaro had tested positive and reportedly said that he would take another test to see if the COVID-19 virus was still active in his body. He has criticized leaders who implemented a quarantine in Brazil. A hospital boat named for Pope Francis has been delivering medical aid along the Amazon River. The boat has been sailing since last July. It is helping rural communities in Brazil's Amazon region. On board are 23 medical experts offering assistance to combat the coronavirus pandemic. Brazil has been one of the hardest hit countries with more than 70,000 recorded deaths. Joining us now is Courtney Mares, Rome correspondent for Catholic News Agency, and she has been following this story. Courtney, great to see you again. Thank you, Tracy. It's great to be back. So, Courtney, why is this hospital boat named after Pope Francis, and how has it been assisting the communities in the Amazon? This hospital boat is the initiative of Brazilian Franciscan friars who say that they were inspired by Pope Francis's World Youth Day trip to Brazil, in which, um, and also the Pope's call for the church to be more like a field hospital. Now this floating field hospital is on the front lines of the fight against the coronavirus pandemic in the Amazon. It's been providing examinations and delivering medications to isolated villages. And in addition to this, um, the ship is equipped with an emergency operating room and an ultrasound machine, and its volunteer uh, medical crew has been providing tens of thousands of consultations and vaccinations for yellow fever, meningitis, and other diseases found in the rainforest since its launch last year. We know Pope Francis has paid particular attention to the indigenous communities in the Amazon. Um, are they being affected at all by the pandemic? Brazil has the second highest number of coronavirus cases after the United States, with more than 1.9 million cases of COVID-19 so far. Uh, despite their isolation, the communities along the Amazon River have not been shielded from this outbreak. And these indigenous communities are particularly vulnerable due to the lack of accessible health infrastructure in the area. Um, for some villages, the nearest hospital is over a half day's boat ride away. Um, this is why early detection and education and how best to prevent the spread of the virus is so important for these communities. Courtney, talk to us about how the church is helping to fight the pandemic in Brazil and Latin America. 
Pope Francis has donated several ventilators to hospitals in Brazil. Actually, one of them was delivered this week to a hospital close to the Amazon rainforest. And the local bishop said that this particular ventilator will be used especially to treat indigenous peoples. Um, Catholic uh, charities in Brazil have also been aiding those in need um, and raising the alarm about the potential devastating effects of an outbreak on the poor and, and vulnerable in this region. One charity, Caritas, says it has already provided more than 100,000 people with food as people face really tough times in this crisis. Well, Courtney, thank you so much for talking with us today. We really appreciate it. Courtney Morez, Rome correspondent for Catholic News Agency. Thanks again, Courtney. Thank you. Coming up, an update on a pro-life bill signed by the governor of Tennessee. And we examine the rise of the cancel culture. Tennessee Governor Bill Lee says he will do whatever it takes to defend a pro-life law banning abortion after a baby's heartbeat is detected. This week, the Republican governor signed what he calls arguably the most conservative pro-life piece of legislation in the country. However, as of now, the measure is being blocked in federal court. Correspondent Mark Irons has the latest. Mark. Tracy, Tennessee is just one of the states trying to implement these heartbeat bills, some stopping abortion as early as six weeks into a pregnancy. And though a legal fight will now begin in Tennessee, backers of this bill say it is designed to withstand court challenges. With the signature of this bill, Tennessee is one of the most pro-life states in America. On Monday, Tennessee Governor Bill Lee signed a law that would not only ban abortion after a heartbeat is detected, but also prevent abortions based on an unborn child's sex or race, or if the child is diagnosed with Down syndrome. Life is precious, and everything that is precious is worth protecting. We know that in Tennessee, and I certainly know that in my heart. But a U.S. District Judge in Nashville is ordering a temporary injunction paving the way for a legal fight to begin. If one part gets struck down in the courts, the rest of it can still stand up. If the courts oppose the pro-life law in its current form, the law could still be applied to different stages in a pregnancy. Katie Glenn with Americans United for Life says Tennessee lawmakers were strategic when they crafted the bill. They also set these specific benchmarks. So eight weeks would be the heartbeat benchmark, but then they say, you know what, court? If you don't like eight weeks, let's try 12 weeks. If you still think 12 weeks violates Casey, look at 14 weeks. Tennessee now joins states like North Dakota, Arkansas, Iowa, Kentucky, Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, Ohio, Missouri, and Alabama, all attempting to secure similar heartbeat laws in the face of court challenges. Tennessee state lawmaker Susan Lynn explained on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly why she believes these laws are so important. And we hope that we can return our nation to, well, states regulating abortion and also um, states supporting life. Tracy, the law in Tennessee would require a doctor to show a pregnant mother ultrasound images of her child, and it would also require abortion clinics to post a sign saying it is possible to reverse a chemical abortion. If they don't do that, they could face a $10,000 fine. Of course, Planned Parenthood and the Center for Reproductive Rights oppose this entire pro-life law. Tracy. Okay, thank you so much, Mark. Correspondent Mark Irons reporting tonight. One well, editor and writer for the New York Times opinion section has resigned, saying that she was harassed for ideas that didn't conform with a liberal point of view. In a scathing resignation letter, Barry Weiss writes, stories are chosen and told in a way to satisfy the narrowest of audiences, rather than to allow a curious public to read about the world and then draw their own conclusions. Weiss continues, my own forays into wrong thing have made me the subject of constant bullying by colleagues who disagree with my views. Joining me now on Skype to talk more about this is Robert George McCormick, professor of jurisprudence and director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. Robbie, welcome back. Great to see you. My pleasure, Tracy. Thanks for inviting me back onto the show. 
Absolutely. Well, cancel uh, culture is a term we've been hearing a lot about these days. It seems to be the latest example of it. Uh, for people not familiar, what exactly is it and what type of impact is it having on free speech? It's rooted uh, in intolerance, dogmatism, an unwillingness to listen to another person's point of view, to seriously entertain what another person has to say, if that person challenges anything you, so, you yourself already believe. That attitude is toxic to truth-seeking, so I hate to see it in institutions that are dedicated to truth-seeking, have as their mission truth-seeking, like colleges and universities. It's also pure poison to a democratic republic, to a polity like ours. In order for this democracy to be sustained and to run according to the vision of our founding fathers, the brilliant vision of those men, it's necessary that we treat each other as fellow citizens, not as enemies. When we treat each other as enemies, then we think that when somebody steps out of line, we need to cancel them. That's what cancel culture is all about. We need to destroy them. We need to make their lives unlivable. We need to make it impossible for them to find employment. We need to drive them out of the institutions where our team or our tribe or our group uh, has control. This, again, is toxic. It is poisonous. Uh, to our civilization. And that's why we have to fight back against cancel, uh, cancel culture. We have to model engaged citizenship, toleration, a willingness to listen to other people, to engage them in a serious way, even if we disagree. And we need to insist on that being the standard for the institutions uh, in which we operate. Yeah, Robbie, I know that you've spoken quite a bit about this and the impact it's had on the world of academia. Uh, let's talk about the piece that you wrote on the difference between critics and bullies. And can you go over the examples in your piece and what stands out in your mind as a key difference between the two? Well, uh, a critic is someone who tries to persuade you with reason and argument. A bully is someone who threatens you your employment, your professional advancement, your educational opportunities, if you dissent in any way from his opinion. There's all the difference in the world between those two things. If someone wants to tell me that I'm wrong to believe, for example, the Catholic faith, uh, or to hold to the pro-life cause, or to believe that marriage is the union of a man and a woman, or to believe that Republican democracy is the right way to go. If someone wants to engage me in argument, give me reasons, cite evidence, and is willing to listen to my counter arguments and allow me to challenge back when they challenge me, I have no problem with that. Far from it, I welcome that because they are now partners with me in the truth-seeking process. We're both open to each other, willing to listen, willing to learn, willing to engage. But if somebody says to me, you had better fall in line with my beliefs, because otherwise I'm going to cancel you. Otherwise I'm going to smear you as a bigot or a hater or a racist or a homophobe. And I'll make sure that with your ruined reputation, you will never work in this town again, as they used to say. Well, that's bullying, and I simply will not stand for it. In fact, I will stand up to the bully. And all of us should do that. Bullies, Tracy, are cowards. Your, your folks told you that when you were a little girl in school on the playground. My folks told me that when I was a little boy. Bullies are cowards. They always turn out to be cowards. And this is exposed when one stands up to them. We need to stop cowering in fear, whether those bullies are on the right or the left or somewhere else. Uh, we should stand up to bullies no matter where we find them, stand by our own rights, and in defending and exercising our rights, know that we are protecting the rights of others. Well, Robbie, do you think, though, that the bullies are winning in all of this? Well, they are because not enough people are uh, exhibiting the courage to stand up to them. Uh, and that's what we need. We need more courage. We're, we're in this country really lacking, wanting, uh, and suffering as a, result, as a result of the lacking and wanting of courage. Uh, my, my, my dear friend Cornell West and I have a piece coming out in the next day or two in the Boston Globe in which we talk about the need for two virtues that are so, uh, uh, so deficient in our culture, honesty and courage. If we would just exhibit more honesty, speaking our minds, uh, saying what we mean, meaning what we say, and if we had the courage to do that, the courage to stand up to the bullies, 
uh, the fearlessness to express the truth as God gives us to see the truth, uh, no matter what other people think, we would preserve this magnificent experiment in ordered liberty and Republican democracy that our founding fathers pledged their lives and, and fortunes and sacred honor to give us. Oh, Robbie, thank you so much for coming on and, and talking with us about this today. We really appreciate it. Always great to see you. Robert George McCormick, professor of jurisprudence and director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. Thank you again, Robbie. My pleasure. Thanks, Tracy. Up next, analysis of the governor of California's decision to close churches again because of the coronavirus. California Governor Gavin Newsom has issued new orders banning indoor events to help curb a spike in coronavirus cases in that state. That ban includes public masses in 30 counties. That said, outdoor masses and other liturgical services such as adoration and prayer services are allowed and are being encouraged. As of today, the total number of coronavirus cases in the U.S. has surpassed 3.4 million cases with more than 136,000 deaths. Here now to help us take a look at where things stand in the fight against COVID-19 is Dr. Kevin Pham, visiting policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation. Dr. Pham, welcome to the show. Great to have you. Uh, thanks for having me. So we're hearing so much recently about this rise in coronavirus cases across the country. What do you think is causing the spike? The spike is the spike is the result, I think, of Americans growing complacent. Um, prior to prior to June, we had been doing very well. We didn't just flatten the curve. We we really sliced the top off of it. If you looked at the uh, the curves of daily cases starting sometime mid April, then the the number of cases really plateaued before before they started to taper off. And we had been doing so well, I think, that Americans got complacent and started going out. And um, the the proper reopening strategy was really a slow return to, to normalcy. But the, the month of June, admittedly, was neither slow nor normal. So I think these factors put together is causing this, uh, this dramatic surge in, in cases. Uh, let's talk about uh, California governor's uh, decision to halt indoor activities, which includes masks. What do you think of Governor Newsom's decision, and do you think it's the right strategy? I think it's a bit. It's going a bit too far. I understand the the need to react to changing realities on the ground, and I think it's appropriate to react. However, he's going very far, and he hasn't released any information about um, where these new cases can be traced to. Um, and then, so indoor activities, especially masks. Uh, I went to. I, I managed to go to church once um, in California before he closed things down again, and the the parish had done a lot to to ensure the safety of its congregants. And quite frankly, uh, shutting down all the indoor activities is punishing, especially mass, but also barbershops and salons and and those kind of businesses is punishing them, even though they've reorganized their lives around COVID-19, is punishing them for the actions of others. And I, I don't think that's necessary. I think the measures that they had put in place would, be, would have been sufficient to maintain uh, mitigation efforts. Well, right now we're in the middle of July, but uh, the school season is, is right around the corner and states around the country are also wrestling with whether or not to reopen schools this fall. As a medical doctor, what would you suggest, and if states do opt for in-person learning, what measures do you think should be in place for the safety of the students as well as the teachers? The, uh, the AAP, the, um, the Pediatric um, Association uh, Academy, they have a really great set of guidelines about what states should do or what uh, school districts should do. But the, the main principle is that the important thing are the students. And so we should have these schools. Um, but that having been said, most of the risk is not going to be coming from the students. Most of the risk is going to be in the adults. So that's staff, faculty, and parents. And those are, those are a lot of potential contacts that we can that we should target our interventions towards. So it's not unreasonable to ask students to wear masks or face shields um, <clears throat> to protect the teachers. And any kind of uh, interactions, for instance, uh, parent parent teacher conferences, that should be done electronically. There should be um, social distancing and the staff lounges and in those kind of areas. But we should have in-person classrooms and uh, make sure our interventions are targeting those at risk, that is the adults, and not, not be punishing the, the students or the children. Well, Dr. Pham, thank you so much for your insight. Dr. Kevin Pham, visiting policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation. Thanks again. Thanks so much.
And finally tonight, tomorrow marks the anniversary of the last appearance of the Blessed Virgin Mary to St. Bernadette. And the shrine in France dedicated to the events is not letting the coronavirus stop its celebration. The shrine at Our Lady of Lourdes is hosting the first ever online world pilgrimage. Millions are set to take part through the internet, television and social media. Organizers say the meeting is a sign of hope and solidarity. The all-day event includes processions, prayers, and the rosary. The shrine in France has been credited with thousands of miraculous healings and conversions. And you can watch the Mass and other events right here on EWTN. Go to EWTN.com for the program schedule. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.